Hi everyone. Sorry to um, cut short this um, fabulous chatting, but there'll be some time for that afterwards. There's more food and we can stay around and keep chatting at the end. Um, can I just start by acknowledging the traditional custodians of these lands that we're meeting on today? Pay my deepest respects to Elders past, present and emerging and acknowledge our First Nations people's deep and lasting connection to land and waters. Thank you all so much for coming today. I've had the pleasure of being Rob's tour guide for the last few days. We did uh, a, a session with council and staff on, um, what morning was it? What day are we? We went through to Can Valley for a lunchtime session, Malakuta in the evening, Buck in the next lunchtime, Benambra last night, and here we are. <laughs> <laughs> it's been wonderful actually to have some, I actually planned it that way, you know, some time in the car with Rob. It's pretty, been pretty, pretty precious. Um, just to um, let you know that we are filming the session today, and um, the reason we're doing that is because we had quite a few community members reach out to us and say, you know, a bit upset, I'm going to miss it, I'm going to miss it. So we thought we'll record a couple of them. Um, we recorded Malakuta as well. Um, and we'll mainly just be recording the bit where Rob's speaking. Um, <clears throat> there'll be time for you to ask questions, please, please do. But at the end, we'll turn the cameras off and we'll let you know when we're turning them off. So that if there's questions that you want to raise without the camera on, there's that opportunity. And also, Rob's really happy to um, hang around at the end and have um, more one-on-one -on -one chat with you as well. So um, it'll be great that you can review this later and that your, you know, your community members who didn't have a chance to come get a chance to, to watch it. Um, I don't think Rob needs much intro introduction. He's a clinical psychologist who's ded dedicated his professional career to supporting people who've experienced trauma, but in, and, in, and part of that is supporting individuals and communities who are recovering from disaster trauma. I'm sure you know who he is, and it's such a, it's such a, so lovely to have you back in East Gippsland, Rob. So thank you very much, and I'll hand you over to Rob. Oh, thanks very much. It's, uh, it's nice to be back here because uh, I carry all the places I go to somewhere inside me, and. Uh, I remember vividly the conversations we've had here in previous visits. So we're now three and a half years down the track. Um, would you have had any uh, expectation of uh, how long it would take? Um, nobody does. And yet <clears throat> it's so clear how long it takes, isn't it? And there's a boundary around a community affected that is quite sharp between those who are involved and experiencing it and understanding it and those who are just on the outside and they don't understand why you haven't got on with it, why you've been uh, dithering and, uh, and why you complain about being tired uh, three and a half years later, what have you been doing to yourselves? And, and this is because they are still cosily nested in their normal everyday life assumptions that don't include bad experiences like disasters. You know, we, it becomes so important in this field to understand what we normally take for granted because that's what is disrupted by the disaster. <clears throat> and the thing that's hard for us to understand is we don't know what we take for granted because we take it for granted. We have an assumption about things. And the essence of a traumatic event is that it permanently destroys assumptions. You can't make them anymore because you know that life might do this to you. You know that there might be a terrible summer with bad bushfires next summer. <coughs> so if you then react to that one way and say, therefore, I'm going to assume every time the wind blows, every time the smoke, every time it's hot, that uh, my whole world is going to be destroyed, you'll probably go and buy a unit in Fitzroy. <laughs> right? 
And if you do that, you'll lose everything you love about this, won't you? Mm -hmm. So you'll suffer a change of who you feel yourself to be. Now, I actually, her, uh, working with a woman who at the age of 11 went through Ash Wednesday with her family, um, the other end of the state. And she realised when she saw a, a video of me giving a talk to one of the other events earlier on, a few years ago, she realised <coughs> that was describing her experience. Interestingly, her family never talked about it as a family, ever. And uh, they just went on with dealing with the van. So there was no processing of it. <clears throat> and looking back, we can understand how this was really a, a very important formative experience in her development that I think we can see uh, it has had a long-term effect on her life, which wouldn't have been visible at the time, would it? It's only the way it shifted her experience of things. As soon as she was old enough, she went uh, to the city to the uni and trained and got a career and then she worked in that career and as soon as she was uh, able to buy a house, she bought one right in the suburbs. And she only ever goes back. She said, I don't like going into the country, especially in the summer. Mm -hmm. So at Christmas time, I'll duck down to the family home and stay there for maybe a couple of nights and I'm back into the city. Now, if you act to remove the threat that causes you anxiety, you don't have anxiety, do you? You just have a restricted lifestyle. I once met a man whose father, he said, got a job as an apprentice and he remained working in that uh, bench for the rest of his career until he retired. He, of course, became more and more competent. They kept trying to ask him to take on more responsibility and become a leading hand and a, a, a team leader, and, and he wouldn't accept any. He just did the same job. And from the time he was married, and he bought a house a couple of kilometres away from this workplace, he only ever made two trips five kilometres to work, five kilometres to the shopping centre. That's all he ever did. Now he was perfectly happy. I bet if you asked him to go to a large shopping mall, he'd demonstrate the symptoms of agoraphobia. <gasps> you know, I can't, but he never went there, so he didn't feel anxiety. Now, round about now, when we start to have some hot summers, we need to probe the adjustments we've made to restore our sense of security and see if we've done that at the expense of the richness and complexity and variability of our lives. Because the risk is that uh, we come out of a traumatic event as a, as a more restricted person. We don't need to, but we have to take on the work. And that means instead of <coughs> forming an assumption that is based on the traumatic experience and say, as soon as it gets warm, I'm going to act as though a life-threatening maelstrom of fire might descend on me any minute. And then you're going to be very alarmed at the, the barbecue next door or something, or a siren going past, aren't you? because you've unconsciously attuned yourself for the next disaster. Now, we call that post-traumatic stress, because you're not going to just get ready. You're probably going to be flooded with memories of the last event. So you're going to get into this state of having loops. And the management of the experience is really the first thing I want to talk about, the first problem, and that's under the broad heading of trauma. Because... Um, if we do that, then we'll find we keep reactivating and making the trauma 
keep living on and we're going to reorganise ourselves around it. It's not reality. We think it's reality. Um, I speak about the man who was involved in a criminal event in which he thought, for very good reason, that he might be shot. Other people were shot. And <coughs> for years later, if anyone dropped a coffee cup in a cafe or somewhere, he went into a state where he got ready for possibly being shot and killed. And of course, that's not very good for our health, so he didn't feel good for the rest of the day. He couldn't work, he would have to go home and uh, he would feel terrible. And what he's done is he's, he's primed himself to watch out and be ready for and then to respond to this event forever. But he's never going to be in another shooting event. This is not the United States. They're very rare events. And I say to him, the most dangerous thing you're going to do that's most likely to kill you is get in your car and drive to my rooms for an appointment. Isn't it? And he laughs. He said, I'm not worried about that at all. Now, what he's done is he's formed the psychological equivalent of a scar, hasn't he? A scar enshrines an injury into our body and it's permanently uh, imprinted. Maybe there's a restriction of movement or something. But he's got lots of restrictions. There's a lot of places he doesn't like to go. And uh, in a person's in that state, they've got to keep track of everything. He wouldn't like to be here, he'd be looking. He'd be looking at you all. Kathy, she's a shady looking character. I better keep an eye on her. Oh. She's got a gun in her pocket. <laughs> Hang on. Uh, uh, Eva's a shady looking person. I've got to keep track of this too. Yeah. And pretty soon, in a place like this full of shady characters, she w he would have to be monitoring and he would get overloaded and say, excuse me, I need to leave, because his anxiety would. Uh, now, it's very logical when you look at the, the fact that he doesn't have the assumption that we have that we're among friends. But he said, but it might. One of them might go crazy any moment you know and there's no way you can answer that is there the only way you can answer it is to build a sense of proportion a sense of risk and say it's not going to happen it's not going to happen now he's at the point where he can say look i know it's not going to happen and when i hear the coffee cup i know i'm not going to be shot but my brain reacts now he's separated his rational consciousness from the, the uh, instinctive mechanism in the brain that have been reactivated so long and so frequently that they are uh, running autonomously. And he's got to now intrude himself and keep talking to himself, say, it's okay, settle down, it's not happening, it's just a coffee cup, and do that for a long time until he gradually brings these two parts of his mind together. Now, in a natural disaster, you can't even begin to do that work until you confront the same circumstances, right? The same, not just summer, but a raging hot summer with a huge stormy wind, right? And we haven't had it, had we? No. So you've had a little bit of a nibble around the edges. But I think it's really important to think about going into this, they're, they're saying terrible things about this summer, aren't they? Yes. As though all that incredible heat from the Northern Hemisphere is just going to ooze down over the equator and... Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> now, it's not going to be the same, is it? It doesn't mean that we won't have dangerous, destructive and life-threatening fires, but they'll be different because the weather's different the vegetation's different, uh, the moisture level in the soil is different. So it's not as though, no, no, it's not going to happen. It's as though we've got to be ready for something we haven't encountered yet. It, you know, it's, uh, it's very clear when you talk to lots of different people about different events, different floods. I've been up working the floods. 
you know, you look at Echuca and Rochester and, and uh, the other places, they're all completely different events. They all involve a lot of water, but the, the quality, the warning, the way in which they happen are completely different. Therefore, the psychological experience is completely different. You think of Echuca waiting, waiting for weeks for this water to come, building an embankment that splits the community, versus Rochester, they wake up and the, they're having to be rescued, uh, and everything in between. So th that I think it's so important that we don't uh, feel tied to what happened, but we can learn from it, learn uh, lessons and rules and principles that are flexible and able to uh, help us adapt and uh, come to grips with the actual risks in the new situation. Um, and uh, so, so I think if we look forward to this, that the work is not done yet of processing the trauma of the day. Don't know if you saw that uh, wonderful program on the ABC the other night. You know, when I've been out talking all this time, I get home to the hotel and my brain doesn't work anymore. So I try to turn on them and look for a really bad action movie. <laughs> and they, oh, they just have these terrible, you know, murder investigations and so on. And so I ended up, as a last resort, watching the ABC, and they had this wonderful documentary <laughs> on the... Uh, I actually weld all my radios and TVs to the ABC when I buy them, and, uh, but, but uh, they had this program where they showed these beautiful young men who went away as conscripts, and now you look at these old, wrinkled, haggard people, am I speaking about myself, who were... <laughs> Um, and they were reflecting back. One man said <coughs> he went recently with a group of friends to Queensland on a golfing expedition. And I forget the exact detail, but he went into the rough to retrieve a ball and a little way off there was a log. And suddenly a memory from Vietnam came they, there'd been a terrible engagement where a lot of Australians had been killed and injured. They were told they had to go in there the next day. They were told all the dead and wounded had been retrieved. We don't leave anyone behind. And he's going into the jungle very carefully. He steps over a log and there's the body of an Australian. It was a re and he said, and not he, but when somebody said, there are two things we could not do, couldn't give any attention to. One was anger and the other was grief because they would disable us as soldiers. We just had to shut them down. Now, these are very dramatic, but the underlying principle is if you've got to suddenly rebuild a house or become incredibly involved in community activities to support your neighbours who have lost their houses, there are things you can't possibly give your attention to, aren't there? because you've got a finite amount of tension. If you put it there, you can't put it there. And stress always involves a, a tunnelling, a narrowing, a focusing of attention onto the stressors. And therefore we lose all of the other things that aren't directly relevant. It's inevitable if you've been in a community like this, in some way you will have been very focused. And you only unfocus when those demands recede. And they probably are slowly receding, probably a lot better now than you were before. But if we take very dramatic, <laughs> traumatic incidents, which I think show in stark relief the same process that happens in a more slow motion way with people after a disaster, you get the following. I remember working with a uh, a, a man working in a human service agency, they had a terrible trauma. They had wonderful managers who organised support immediately. He had time off, I had a session with him and when he'd had time off, I had another couple of sessions. And it was very important for him that he preserved his self-esteem and seeing a psychologist implied 
you know, he wasn't really quite onto it, and uh, uh, so he, he didn't really want to come, but uh, we had a couple more sessions. We sorted quite a lot of stuff up. Then he came back to another session. He said, I'm actually feeling a lot better. I'm sleeping better. I'm actually able to concentrate. Uh, I think I'm nearly ready to go back to work. Now, it was a very traumatic event. Uh, and uh, he, he said that, um, I think I'm more or less over it. Now, I said, that's fantastic. I'm so pleased. Why don't we just make another appointment for a couple of weeks? Just make sure that everything's moving along. Oh, all right. When he came back, he said, actually, I realise I'm sleeping even better now than I was before, and I'm more relaxed. I can read a book now, and I realise I must have been still up in that state of arousal, but I didn't realise it. See... To realise the state you're in, you'd be able to step back from it, don't you, and look at it. Or maybe get some feedback from somebody else, saying, geez, you're looking terrible. Uh, <laughs> or even worse, hey, you look absolutely fantastic because you're in high arousal like and you're running around like this and you're feeling utterly exhausted inside. This is what happens to me sometimes, probably tomorrow. And I'm, I say, you look really well. Rob, where have you been? I've been down in Gippsland running around. <laughs> uh, and then you wait. On Saturday, I go, boom. Uh, this is the dynamics of the energy process that healthy people activate. Now, he didn't know. Well, this went on for about two months. And every time he came, let's just have one more to see if, you know, he, he was able to look back and say, I wasn't out of it yet. I'm still not out of it. It took about three months for his arousal to normalise after that event. And that's with ideal circumstances. So we don't know our state of arousal. We've got to observe ourselves. And uh, it's that time that's inevitable. Now, if you then go into a lot of reconstruction activity, uh, you've got a lot of hassles. When, when uh, they've done research on uh, you know, health-related issues, they realise you can talk about big things, loss of partner and divorce and, you know, financial problems, but they find that it doesn't really explain everything. They've got to introduce a factor called daily hassles. Daisy, just all the trivial annoyances. That's a really important factor to determine the quality of a person's life, the number of hassles they have. Uh, because they don't just add, they multiply, don't they? You have lots of hassles. And so it becomes important really to think about how do we uh, have a recovery process going on that allows us the option to digest what's happened, take out the lessons and be ready for next time. And we don't do that when we're in high arousal. Because when we're in high arousal, we're attuned to the most concrete threat. And if it's a disaster, it's going to be the, that one coming back. And things get sort of glued into that kind of uh, high stress situation. And so you can't process it. You just keep adapting to it. It's a risk that you move into a high arousal lifestyle. Uh, you know, you, you can't relax. So when you do have time off, you, you either have a migraine and go to bed or you manufacture a whole lot of things and rush around and help other people or something. And we know we can get into a, a state of high arousal. That's all right for a year or two or three, but eventually it's going to be a health risk, isn't it? So I, I think round about this time, there's a transition. If people get into their house, you no longer have the very concrete orientation you've had up until that mo moment uh, where everything's as though that's going to be the solution. But what people unexpectedly find is, first of all, they don't feel the way about their new house that 
we normally feel about a new house where we're really looking forward and going repeatedly to visit a furniture then oh it's fantastic when will it be ready and you can't wait to move in and when you do move in you start screaming at the kids because they've left a mark you yell at the dog and throw it out because it's scratched no what people have told me i remember the woman uh, in ash wednesday who said i actually feel embarrassed about my new house I don't want anyone to come because it feels like a motel. It doesn't have anything of me in it. It's just no heart in it. And there's a curious sense of shame. Uh, and they don't want people to come until a dog has scratched the walls <laughs> and the kids have made messes and it feels lived in. Isn't it curious? Uh, and people don't understand what's going on for them. And of course, their friends say, you must be so pleased to have your new house. You've done well. I wish I had a new house. And you don't want the new house. Uh, we attach to things, don't we? I worked with a family from Macedon who had bought a... Uh, heritage listed wooden cottage. You've probably got them all over the place down here. <laughs> yeah, that's right. But there'll be a few around. I've passed a few. Uh, they moved in and they paid a very expensive architect to do plans for a beautiful, tasteful, artistic, heritage informed extension. But it burned down before they could. So they whacked up a brick veneer and moved into brick veneer. About 18 months after they moved in, they came for a consultation and said, we're driving ourselves mad as a family. We're not getting on. So when we listened to what was happening, they described how they were only living in the kitchen, the living room and the main bedroom. And the kids didn't want to go to their own bedrooms in another wing. They didn't use the lounge room. Uh, they wanted to sleep in with the parents, you know? And, and so everyone was sort of driving each other mad. They, they were on top of each other the whole time. And after we'd sort of analysed this, they came back the next week and said, you know what we've realised is we're only living on the footprint of our old house. We haven't moved into the new house. We're still living in the old house. So there's something about the deep unconscious uh, assumptions. And basically, they, once they recognised that, they could actually, uh, the kids could start to say, hey, maybe I'll have a bedroom of my own. That'll be fun. And, and move in and start to... But they had to make a shift, didn't they? From the conservative, I want to hang on to something because I've lost so much, to... Oh, it's an adventure, I can have a new life. And this part of, I think, the psychology of moving into the new house, that we can relinquish what we had and embrace the future. And that involves the second point. The first point I want to talk about uh, is trauma. And we can associate stress with it. The second point is loss which is dealt with by grief. Grief is the process, psychological process by which we come to grips with loss and don't say stuck on the loss and try to keep hanging on to it, which is unsuccessful because it's not there. Uh, so grieving means to recognise, to, to memorialise, to remember, to really convert a, uh, a real physical thing, person, whatever, into a mental presence of a memory. Yes, I had that. And I can go at any time into my memory and uh, evoke the feelings and what it told me about who I was and so on. And to have a lot of those means to have a history, a sense of a narrative of my life and how I got to here and then we got the turmoil of the disaster and to come out the other end and I'm now this person. That presupposes we do a lot of processing, digesting, integrating. Um, and 
if we don't do the grieving, the mourning, um, then we don't register the loss. And if we don't give attention to these processes and keep giving attention to the narrative of our life and the unfolding process, we get an experience which I think of as like a time warp. Somebody said it just this morning when I got here. Uh, this sense that, oh my God, is it three and a half years? It feels like it was just yesterday. Uh, when the fire does you ever have that experience it just feels like yesterday and then at the other end of how much longer is this going to go on it feels like I've been in this space for as long as I can remember and this this double reference really of no time and unlimited time this seems to be an absolute uh, characteristic of having lived a swag of your life in a very high stress state and what I think that means is that you haven't had sufficient time to give attention to this digestive process, which always, like lunch, goes on in the background. Now, if after you'd eaten this lovely lunch, I got you out on the road and fired a starting gun and said you can stop when you get to Melbourne, you would probably lose the lunch around about Bairnsdale, wouldn't you? Because you wouldn't be able to digest it because the blood would all be going to your limbs before you fell over exhausted with me. Uh, can you see that you need to sit quietly and give time to have leisure to digest? And that's in short supply in the last three and a half years. Even when you're sitting quietly, you're ruminating, worrying about the future. You know, you don't look as though you're doing anything, but you're really busy, you know. And all of that is at the expense of what gives our lives a sense of quality, a sense of meaning, this sense of a narrative. Which is why it's been so important, and you would be one of the communities that I refer to, why you maintained your community conversations. Uh, because that's joining with other people in reflecting. The digestive process is exactly the opposite to a focused, rational, reality-based, logical thinking process. It's more like our dream process of letting things come and go. In fact, dreaming is very important because if you deprive people of dreaming, they behave pretty soon as though they're not getting any sleep at all. This fiendish psychologist who put wires on people's heads. They can tell when they're rapid eye movement sleep and they wake them up. If they're in deep sleep and they've just got the whatever waves, they let them sleep. And every time they go into the dream sleep, they wake them up. In fact, along with the people who are part of the control group uh, who are not being allowed to have any sleep at all, they actually become uncooperative and after a few days they say, you know what you can do with your effing experiment? I'm going home to bed. Uh, <laughs> they say it's very interesting, it's very hard to do this research because people don't cooperate. Um, if you deprive them of their deep sleep and let them have their REM sleep, in the, in the period of the experiment there's not much difference from uh, them and the people who are having natural sleep. Actually, um, I think in the long term that will undermine health. I think the deep sleep is, to put it simplistically, when our body is replenished. And the dreaming sleep is when our mind is refreshed by processing and letting go of stuff. Now, I read a book where somebody quotes research where they keep the the electrodes on during the day and what they say you see we have this 90 minute cycle don't we mm. during sleep deep sleep and the last 20 minutes is dreaming and then deep sleep and dreaming and it changes a bit over the course of the night but if you keep the electrodes on you'll find that rhythm goes on throughout the day if I were to talk to you for much more than about 90 minutes without drawing breath even though you're well motivated and polite, I'll start to see your eyes crossing. 
and you'll be thinking, I wonder if there are any of those sandwiches left. I'm going to go for the chicken and lettuce. Uh, you know, your, your, your mind is wandering and you're starting to lose the track and then you think about the shopping and what you want to do on the weekend and so on. And it's this movement between the free-floating associational thinking where you... You know, I might say a word and that'll make you think of something and before long you're, you've, you've, you haven't heard anything because you've gone off on some other. You know, the, we can only hold that attention, that concentrated attention, for about 90 minutes. Um, maybe if you're well trained and highly motivated, you could hold it for about two hours. But you biologically have to disengage. Otherwise you start to make mistakes and forget things and so on. Now where I'm going with this is to say this demonstrates how important the free-floating, daydreaming, relaxed, associative uh, mental processes are. They're undervalued in our culture because we're all about rationality and problem solving and efficiency. No, we have to go into this wafty, inefficient, meandering kind of thinking to actually give it, I call it the mulling stage, to mull things over, to get them into perspective, to process the emotions, to think of new ideas, to be creative, to let emotions go. Now, if we're grieving, that'll be the time we'll feel sad and think about things, maybe shed some tears. Now, the sooner we do that, the better. I was talking to great big farmer last night the people in Benambra didn't really want to talk about this fire they were still talking about the 2003 fire which was very traumatic for them and I don't think they've talked about it very much and this man talked about uh, shooting cattle uh, and he said uh, you just have to do it it's, that's life. You just When a fire comes, you have to shoot the cattle. Because if you don't, they'll be there tomorrow and then the next day. And then you've got to dig a hole and bury them all. Now, there's a resilience factor in that when he says, that's life. So he's showing that one of his assumptions is, on a farm, terrible things happen and you have to do horrible things to cattle every now and again. So he's incorporated that as part of his assumption. So it's not that that is traumatic, I don't think. And then he said, we took a lot of videos, you know, but I can't really watch them. Actually, my wife and I were going to try and watch them the other day, but I couldn't watch them. And then you could see the tears forming in his eyes. You know, now, we were drinking a cup of tea after a meeting. It wasn't the time to go into it. But you can see he's on the edge of an unprocessed experience that is 10 years old. You, know, you think of the Vietnam veteran who has, the, for the first time, he reactivates by associative experience of the log a 40-year-old trauma that has not received any intent attention. Um, and we know this. There's a big study in the United States across the whole country all sorts of trauma, and they ask people, when did you come for help with that trauma? The mean time, now the mean is when there is as many people on one side as there are on the other, was 12 years. What's happening in those 12 years? We're shutting it down and trying to get on with things. But the one thing I can't afford to do when I've shut something down, is to go into this meandering, mulling, associative. As one of them said last night, uh, one of these farmers, he's not a psychologist, he said exactly what I've said. The problem is, well, maybe it was the Vietnam veterans. You know, when I give all these talks, I have no idea what I've said to anyone when I get to this stage <laughs> of the week. But... It was a person who wasn't a psychologist, either a farmer or a veteran. He said, the problem is if you shut one feeling down, you have to shut them all down because they're all tied together, aren't they? 
That's why we are an integrated being, because everything's connected. And so this comes back to ways in which we might restrict ourselves. Now, what they were saying up there is people are not the same since that fire. They're not the same. And it's often the wives are saying, you need help, you're not the same. Leave me alone, I'm OK. And probably some men are jabbing their wives and saying, you're not the same. Actually, one of the women said, she turned to me and said, you know, while they were all out fighting the fires and probably killing cattle and so on, we were all making food together and talking. We talked it through. I think it's a really interesting gender issue. Uh, and look how many men we've got here, you know. Uh, well-informed, enlightened men, I might add. <laughs> Paragons of masculinity. If only we had more, you know. But, but actually, a lot of men, their work is about things and stuff, isn't it? Whereas with women, it's about people and feelings uh, and relationships and social fabric. Uh, and, and so, you know, maybe the women have done more processing than the men. And you can see this community has got a sense of... Uh, this is really still there for us. And it's such a wonderful insight, I think, that they have. That, and, uh, you know, a lot of people came to the talk, um, only rivalled by the number of people here. Uh, you know, there's a lot, of, lot more people, like the, the whole community turned out. So, you know, and it seems there's such a wonderful resource there to build up this process of coming together and just talking. And letting that free, mulling, associative talking do the work. Uh, and maybe sometimes people might sort of have trouble shifting something and they might need somebody with a bit of training. But, but it's that, that mulling, digestive process that's so important. And so when we think of coming back to the idea of loss, part of the process of dealing with loss is to, is to actually be able to reposition things so that... Uh, instead of this great gaping hole of what's missing, I'm actually no longer assuming the thing or the person to be there in the real world and every time I come to where it should be, it's not there. But yes, I, I accept deep down in that fabric of assumptions that it's not there and instead I put the focus on my internal uh, experience of the thing. So it's a shift of emotion, isn't it, from out there on the thing to in there in me. Uh, and I want it to be out there, but it's not. And so it takes us a long time to accept a reality we don't want, doesn't it? Uh, and, and we have to put energy into it. Well, you don't do that if you're building a house, for instance. Or, shall I dare I say, competitive tendering with the government agencies. Uh, uh, now, there's another thing that interferes with this psychological work for recovery and also interferes with the uh, physical work of recovery because it's very demanding. Um, Decision-making is exhausting, isn't it? There's a, a psychologist, professor of psychology, you know, they've got to think up experiments to do. And he got a whole lot of students and measured their hand grip on a, you know, one of those hand grip measuring machines. Measured their hand grip and then sat them down and made them try and solve logical problems, mathematical problems. You know those annoying things that they sometimes read out on the radio? They've got lots of... I, I've got better things to do with my intelligence than work on those. But, you know, they're complicated problems, including, he said, he in included uh, for some one group a, a problem that was actually insoluble, but you wouldn't realise that until you've spent about half an hour on it. And then you realise there's no solution to this. So they're really cudgelling their brains for half an hour. I can't remember the exact details. And then he simply gets them to measure their grip. And their grip is statistically weaker. 
you know, does large groups, as though they've been doing this for the last half hour and they can't do it. You see, that's why you can't make decisions. There was a woman from Black Saturday who told the story, you know, house is going up. She's really, really tired, probably around about this stage. And the builder rings up and says, Mary, yeah, I'm at the tile shop. Uh, what colour do you want the tiles around the vanity basin in your ensuite? I don't care what bloody calls you have, just get it done. And a few years later, she says to her husband, why have we got lime green tiles <laughs> around our... Can you see how that would happen? In fact, somebody wrote, I think it was the same woman, wrote a very good children's book about the journey of recovery and there's a point where there's a picture of the mother having a complete meltdown. I don't care what, uh, you know, um, decision-making fatigue. It takes real energy. It's very important, if you're going to make important decisions, that you get fit for it mentally, you know, that you've got the energy. And how do we get energy? Mulling. Dreaming, uh, taking time out, um, and uh, and this is really part of one of the messages I've been giving is that the essence of recovery is not so much replacing what you've lost, but creating the foundation for the next stage of your life, and that involves getting outside the set of assumptions you had before, and the idea of the disaster as a uh, a kind of loss of direction and trying to get back on track, but rather stopping and thinking, and that takes time. So I always think that, uh, for not for everybody, some people's lives, they're very clear, they know what they want to do, they know where they want to go, and they just rebuild and keep going. But for many people, it's, it's a change, it's a watershed experience. Life will be different. So what do I want? I need time, really, to think about that. And... Uh, you know, some people can do it quickly, some people do it slowly for all sorts of reasons. I think it's incredibly important to respect that process. So I've talked about the trauma, which includes the stress and the loss. Um, I wanted to go on and talk uh, about other, a couple of other factors, but I wondered if anyone's got any questions or comments about what I've said or has anything come to mind? Eva, you'll have to keep time for me because I won't have any idea how long I should be talking. <laughs> Anyone got any thoughts or questions? Yeah. But um, uh, when you made the comment about the you know, paradigms of masculinity, the one of which I happen to be married to, mm -hmm. even during the fire, um, the communication um, throughout the family, most, a lot of the information was coming from our neighbours, um, uh, and that was all being handled by the women in each household. Um, and I think that was really useful. Um, so it sort of it starts off in this very, I guess, moment of this impact. Um, but what are the men doing? Is that because the men are doing the work? Yes. The f often physical work, oh, and, very much so. or keeping their employment going so that you can fund things. Yep. Uh, oh, absolutely. Yeah, that's yeah. right. No, I don't, so. I don't so no, no, I'm, I'm just saying that's often to do with the cultural division of, uh, of roles, yeah. which, where women's roles engage them with each other and with verbal exchange. Because many men are doing physical stuff or, you know, in their jobs doing <coughs> focused stuff on whatever their, their work is. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, in some ways, 
it's often the women that hold the communities together and it's often the women that uh, I know this from when I give my talks and start talking about things and the women start elbowing their husbands <coughs> and you can see that this, they've got this monitoring function you know it probably begins with newborn babies listening to them and so on um, and then they have to get to their husband it's your turn uh, they don't wake up so intuitively well, present company has accepted, I'm sure. Sorry, sorry, sorry to uh, make a second comment. It was just a, another comment that kind of arrived up. Um, on a community level, though, we've got a lot of men who are quite active um, and yep. are really driving things and um, uh, for which I'm just about with that. So, men on that, I think we would be as a community where we are. Yeah. Well, of course, so uh, it really shows that it doesn't have to be gendered. Uh, it, it's, uh, it, that's to do with the, the social fabric we come out of and we really all need to be contributing our own unique gifts to the situation which means we've got to have uh, <coughs> a lot of social structures that keep opening and inclusive uh, rather than getting too efficient and too sort of uh, highly differentiated but to keep drawing people in. And people will come in at all sorts of stages. Interestingly, um, after Black Saturday, because of all the deaths, there was this huge uh, amount of donated money. And uh, looking around in the latter stages, I think around the, the fourth year, what are we going to do with this money? And uh, the men, the vulnerability of men was identified. And so there was a, a program to offer getaways for men. And there was a young Salvation Army, uh, you know, youth worker type, who was given the role of um, facilitating a men's long weekend fishing trip. And all these men booked in, and he said to me afterwards, they... They all went fishing and they had a nice rural area and uh, uh, they sat around and talked about anything but the fire until they got to Sunday afternoon, Sunday evening. They stoked up the fire, they'd caught lots of fish, they had this really beautiful meal out of fish and then they sat quietly around the embers of the fire and started to talk about the fire experience. And they spent the, the whole evening talking about what happened on the day. And most of them said, that's the first time I've ever spoken about it. So it's like creating an environment for talking. The Vietnam veterans were not welcomed by the RSL. That wasn't a real war. So they didn't get the kind of conversation that could have been very helpful. Even if they didn't talk about the traumatic, they'd have a sense of inclusion and belonging and and they get pushed away and uh, there were there was one man who said he'd been drinking in a pub with three regulars for many years and only after the Vietnam uh, welcome home parade did they find out each of them had been in Vietnam you know and this fracturing yeah Ellen you mentioned um, the man getting together as the retreat. Yep. In Tasmania, the Vietnam vets have actually gone and purchased land up in the lakes area, put up a dwelling, they've had it down for a number of years, and it's available for any Vietnam vet or group mm. and they sent mm. their families mm. to go to. Yeah. And I've been there, and there's a wonderful sense of peace. And when there are others about, I like my camaraderie and going over common experiences would be very beneficial. Yes. Yes. That type of retreat, I think, would be a huge benefit if it were replicated. Yeah. 
in other states. Yeah. That's certainly the case in Tasmania. Yeah. Yeah. So you're building a framework of assumptions. We are assuming that we've all got this experience in common or some aspect of it in common. And that helps us, you know, when we find commonalities, we have, it becomes part of our identity. You and me are the same. Now, there's, some, there's a problem with that because the temptation is to think we all went through the same disaster. No, we didn't. Everyone had their own unique experience. And there's a temptation to think it's really the ones who lost their houses we should be sympathetic for. They're the ones with the real problems. If you didn't lose your house, you, you know. Or some Black Saturday people would say, you only lost stuff. I've lost family members. You know, and, and so there's a natural tendency that works against that common identity to actually differentiate. The, the real deeper psychology is there's always a risk that we'll lose our sense of who we are if we become part of a very large group. So I'm going to say, no, I'm different from you. So what we need is a, an environment where there's a recognition of uniqueness within an overarching experience. It doesn't have to be simplistic, we all went through the same thing, or we should only be sympathetic with those who lost a lot. And uh, this... Uh, American researcher that I've been quoting, Daniel Aldridge, uh, shows this slide of an, the interviews he did with 3,000 New Orleans survivors of the Hurricane Katrina that are mapped on this map and colour coding according to how profoundly they were affected by the experience. And the map is shaded according to the depth of water and he asks what's the relationship between the depth of water and the severity of impact and there's no relationship at all and they've done all this statistical analysis and there's no relationship it's it's you know it's too simplistic to align the psychological and emotional consequences with the physical consequences the intervening factor is what does everything mean and so we, we need to um, have at the back of our mind, particularly around the idea of grief, what is somebody grieving for? They might be grieving for lost neighbours. I've talked with people, I remember talking to a woman after the Canberra fires whose house was the only one left on the street. And she said, it's terrible to live in a street where everyone is gone, when we all were good friends before, I feel so alone and none of my friends want to visit me because they get upset. You know, they're protecting us themselves. And this once again sort of uh, brings to light this boundary between the affected and the unaffected that is so important. And this has sort of repercussions around networks it happens with disaster, it happens with traumas. Um, I worked with a very gregarious young woman who had had a very emotionally deprived, uh, gruelling upbringing, uh, but she'd done well. She'd gone off and become a social worker. Uh, but she used to really love playing up. You know, she'd go out with her friends, they'd drink a little bit too much, they'd dance a lot, make a lot of noise and have a fantastic time. Then she had a really serious trauma and after I'd been working with her for some time she was starting to get going. She came along one day and said, I've taken a decision, I'm going to cull my friends. Right? We complain about culling kangaroos and brumbies. Mm -hmm. She culled her friends. She said, I've realised only some of them are of any value to me. That many of them are just along for the ride. You see, when, when we're all having a nice time, we don't realise the relationship is being maintained by the energy I'm putting into it. And, uh, and if you say, look, I'm not able to come... Can you come to me? Oh, no, I'll come later. You know, the, as long as it's flowing, you don't realise this. 
but particularly in the state of, uh, you know, how things are now and in that period after you move into the house where you really need to be probably giving space to grieving a lot of stuff that you've forgotten you had, um, you actually don't have the energy to keep pumping it out to people who, who are not giving you anything back. And uh, the extreme is, um, I once met a man, it was in the Grampians of all places, at a, at a flood recovery, or the flood out there. And he told me this too, he said, oh, you worked in, in Ash Wednesday. Uh, my family was burned out in Ash Wednesday. And then he told me the story that uh, he'd grown up with his cousin they had been really close friends. They'd gone to the same school together. The families all went on holidays every year together. They met their partners and got married at around the same time and both were best men for each other's wedding. And then when they had kids, they all went on holidays together. Then he got burnt out. And he said a couple of days after it happened, he got a phone call from his cousin and said, how are you going? What do we say? All right. Uh, you weren't involved in that terrible fire. You say, yeah, we lost any, everything. Oh, oh, oh. But you'll be all right, won't you? Yeah, yeah, we'll be all right. Oh, well, good luck then. He said, I've never heard from him again. You know, he couldn't stretch over the horrible event. You know, there are a lot of people, I, I, I just can't cope with it. I don't want to know about it. Um, but you don't know that uh, if your life doesn't provoke that. And so this comes back to the, the set of assumptions. We don't know what our assumptions are. He said, I, occasionally I've looked him up in the phone book. <coughs> Remember when we used to have phone books? <laughs> and I've noticed he moved house a couple of times, but he's not in it anymore. Uh, I don't know what's happened to him. I don't even know if he's died. Now, now, this is a very uh, dramatic example of how relationships can be lost because one or other of the people can't go the journey. They didn't choose it. They don't want it. Um, and I tell the story about the woman that uh, was very involved in running the health network in Mount Macedon after the bushfire there a very creative, again, gregarious, interesting person that I worked closely with over the four years that I was involved. I met with her regularly and so on. She was burnt out. Uh, other members of her family were burnt out in that fire. She'd lived in that area all her life. As it happened, a few years later, she came to work at the children's hospital and we had lunch every now and again together. And when I was starting to get a sense of this, one day I asked her, I said, Mary, uh, tell me, you've lived in that area all your life. Now, a few years afterwards, who's in your personal friendship network that was there before the fire? And it was like a cartoon, her jaw dropped. I haven't realised, none. Mm. Now, um, you know, what I like to say is that... Um, there's been research since about the 1940s that shows that the number one protective factor for mental or physical illness is good social support. And of course now we start to talk about social capital and these concepts, but good so having people who care about you who will put time and energy into you. Now, therefore, at a time when you most want the social support system to remain stable around someone, it melts away and they have to go through the hard work of rebuilding a new set of relationships. And this seems to me a very important message about why it's so profoundly important to hold together a community network, because inevitably that boundary will mean there'll only be some of them that will hang in there. Others will melt away because they don't want to deal with the pain. And so uh, it does mean also that maybe you need to really look around. Who's been helpful? Who's open to you? Who, who's willing to be part of it? And, and uh, as time goes by, be putting energy out into that to see if 
you can build the, re the relationships because we do need them. Um, and, uh, yeah, I wonder if there's any other questions about that before I say a few more things before. I just wanted yeah. to say that in my experience with case management, so many people have described the loss of friends or networks or, or whatever, bushfire as well, like through their network. Um, and, and that's just... It's such a job. common, yeah. And I think it's because they've moved out of the set of assumptions that framed their life and the others haven't. And you don't know what your assumptions are. They don't know they're in a different world. Yeah. Did you have a question? those Russian dolls, you know, mm -hmm. where you have kind of like what it seems on the outside, there's all, all these other ones inside. And it's kind of sometimes it seems like that you sort of think, well, how did we get to this? We're talking about this, you know. But kind of like going with it seems to be really helpful. And you don't remember how you got there. That's the associative process. Yes. Uh, that, that is creative. You know, it will gather everything up because everything is connected somehow by association. Uh, that's why those free-floating conversations are incredibly valuable. Uh, and, and you need things like trust and confidence and you need to be sure that there's kindness in the room, uh, non-judgment. Um, and uh, somebody in Buchan, I coined the term that uh, uh, Eva and I have been using all weekend. Well, no, it's not weekend, is it? We all the week. Uh, basal confidence, and uh, she'd read it somewhere. It seems like a great term. Some really foundational sense of confidence, and it's going to come from probably shared experiences. The people that often, the friends that often stick, are the friends who've had a serious illness, a bereavement, uh, a trauma, a car accident, uh, a divorce or something. They've had some really uh, demanding experience in life. It doesn't have to be the same. But I say, gee, I, you're going to need some support, support, aren't you? Would you like me to do whatever? Uh, and they bring their own suffering. This is really important about how we grow through difficult experiences. Um, and to do that, we need a culture that helps us do that. Yeah. Uh, I wanted to just say a couple more things before I conclude. Um, so what we're starting to talk about, particularly when uh, we're talking about, say, moving into your new house or um, reflecting on and grieving for what's lost, is we're starting to talk about what that tells you about yourself or each other or your family. Now, um, go back to that idea of the time warp, which happens through inadequate mulling, inadequate free-floating processing, which means inadequate leisure. Have you been a bit short of leisure over the last three and a half years? See, leisure really means you don't have to do anything, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. Now, we're never, never going to not have to do anything, but we can carve out time when we say, this is my leisure time, I'm not going to do anything, I'm not going to answer my phone. And we can eventually train people. That it's no good ringing Robert said after, and he never answers his bloody phone. Mm -hmm. Wait till Sunday morning early, that'll get him. You can train people. Uh, and we, it's our responsibility to train people that our, we've got our leisure time. And, and then, you know, I've said that the essence of stress 
is it's an adaptation that responsible people engage in in order to fulfil their responsibilities. And we do that by overriding and silencing the natural feedback systems that will tell us what we need. And so instead of saying, gee, I'm feeling tired, I'm sick of waiting on the phone for Telstra yet again, or listening to unhappy bushfire or flood victims, uh, I'm not going to do it anymore. So what you have is a person who bails from the situation. And that's not to say we don't all have our limit. But now, healthy, competent people don't bail out of the situation and have a happy life. They actually override their response and say to themselves, shut up and keep working, right? In various ways. Continuously through the afternoon, shut up and keep working, day after day, just keep working. So that really means I'm actually intercepting the, at every level, the psychological, the physiological, even the neurological systems that are feedback systems that are telling me you shouldn't be doing this. You should stop and have a nice time. And if you do that continuously, the risk is you, you lose awareness of what you lost. You've lived a grim, austere and joyless existence the last three and a half years. Now, I'm overplaying it, of course. But, of course, do you then remember what you used to enjoy before? Well, you had a different house and a different community and a different lifestyle. Maybe there's a risk you actually lose your bearings. Can you see how important it is to keep hold of the sense of a narrative of your life that holds the relation uh, to your past experience and who you were and what was important and you through the turmoil of this and, and then looking forward to who you want to be and what you've learned? And uh, I think it's really important that people are able to hold on to uh, what's important. So a question that I think is worth asking around about now is what did I used to do on a routine basis before the fire? Because if you did it on routine, it was really anchored into your, the fabric of your life. You didn't have to make decisions, you just routinely did it. What did you used to do that gave your life value, meaning, joy, health, whatever? And it's actually, when you've got a really difficult time, it's so easy to lose it. Someone was telling me, they used to get up and go to the gym every morning. And then they got a bit unwell and they felt a bit too tired to do it, so they didn't do it for a week. And then a couple of months later, they realised they'd forgotten to go back to the gym. Have you ever had that happen? Mm -hmm. that, that it's very easy for things to just drop away when you're so focused. Leisure would mean I'm oh, really waiting to go to the gym. I haven't been. I didn't get there yesterday, so I'm really looking forward to having my swim or my walk around the garden. Or and it, so. I think it's really important to harness pleasure to those things because that will motivate us to keep going. And so around about now we should be asking, what did I used to do? What was important for me then? Am I still doing it? If I'm not, what am I doing instead? Uh, sitting in the corner and eating Mars bars maybe. Uh, but maybe you've replaced it with other enjoyments. Other many, have your values changed? There's a lot of research in the United States which says people's values change. They become less attached to material possessions, more appreciative community relationships and friendships and, uh, and those humanistic values rather than material values, which of course can be a problem with friends and family. Um, but but, but this, this reviewing now, uh, particularly as we start to get hopefully to, towards the other end of the recovery process to actually th uh, try and work out what have you um, lost track of? What have you lost that was quality, adding quality to your life? 
And, uh, you know, I think when you have this, you know, I've talked about the, the high adrenaline survival process in the immediate aftermath, which I was thinking uh, after one of my talks, I was remembering, uh, you know, when I talked about this in Whittlesea, and I talked about this adrenaline, and suddenly in the middle of a man sitting about where Eva was says, excuse me, uh, how long can you stay in that? Now, I'd never really thought about that question. And I had to quickly think, well, you go into it because you're under threat. So I said to him, I guess you'll stay in it as long as you're in threat. But not just the threat of the fire, but financial problems, insurance problems, business problems. And he said, uh, it was about six months later, he said, I think I'm still in it. I lost my business, I lost my house, I lost my son. I've got this problem, I've got that problem, I've got that problem. I'm still in it. And this was a revelation to me because, yes, he was, he was clearly, he hasn't come out of it. I was thinking most of them would have stabilised. So uh, that's the first state. Then you go into the long, gruelling cortisol, chronic stress state of the whole guts of the recovery, which takes, I'll just say, a few years. It's not continuous. There'll be sparks of adrenaline coming in, but, but there's a long process. And then eventually, let's put it simplistically, you, you've made your decisions, you move into your new house. And then uh, you can relax with all the things you were doing to build a house. And then I think, something that I just put a very broad framework around, I say, then you enter stage three, identity crisis. Who am I? What am I on about? Including, what have I lost? What does it mean? What have I still got? Where am I headed? Uh, I talk about the young woman in uh, King Lake at the, at the fourth year. Uh, after a long and turbulent meeting in which the King Lakeians, who are a tough bunch of customers, had been criticising government uh, for all sorts of, you know, probably quite valid things. And then finally, sort of, the government just did the right thing. They just absorbed it all and absorbed it all and absorbed it all. Said, OK, we'll do this and that. And then it all settled down. Interesting. And only then, when it was sort of, went into a sort of reflective stage of the meeting, another young woman said, um, you know, actually, I'm, I hope you don't mind me saying this, but I'm quite enjoying decorating my new house. I've never decorated a house from the beginning. I've always moved into houses. And I'm really enjoying it. It's a really creative thing to do. Uh, the other day, I made a cup of tea on Saturday morning. I sat down in the sun and I thought, now, what were the goals of my life before the fire? See, you wouldn't even ask the question until you're well into your decoration process. Mm -hmm. And then she said wistfully, but I couldn't remember. Now, we know that, uh, and I've talked with you here and other places about the memory problems when you're in stress mode. If we can't remember our life, it's actually all in there, but it's not organised, so we can't access it, then you, s you, you must lose the narrative. And if you lose the narrative, you lose the sense of self, because our sense of self is a narrative. You know, it's, I remember myself last year and 10 years ago and 40 years ago, and that's still me. It's all part of the layers of who I am. If, uh, if you... Uh, if you haven't got a good memory, you're not actually building your narrative through these crucial years. You have the time warp I talked about. It's been going on forever. It was just yesterday. Mm. And it becomes so important, I think, to be able to look back as you start to get out and say, what have we been through? What's it been like? Uh, and th this is where I think the artists of the community are so important to portray that in music and poetry and, and drama and uh, painting and books and because all of that art is the reflection back and the building of identity. So we have, I think we have a period, an inevitable period 
of coming to grips with what does this mean about my life? What, who am I now? What are my new goals? Are they the same or are they different? Have I learnt or am I still grieving? Do I feel diminished or do I feel there is opportunities here? And again, I think a culture is so important of a community where people are bringing different words and different experiences together. It was very hard to do this by yourself. Rituals, memorials, you know, events, uh, and so on. Tied to physical events. You're going to renovate this hall, aren't you? Is that right? Replace it. Replace it. What a celebration it will be. It'll be a sort of symbol of uh, a, a, a community that's come out the other side, won't it? And these, I think these, these uh, ritualistic elements speak to the deep layer of our identity that we don't know about. You know, I was thinking about this for years and then I, I spent 13 years getting my PhD, God help me. And they finally sent me a letter saying, congratulations, you've got your PhD. And I thought, oh, thank God for that. And then you've just forgotten about it, and they send you another letter saying, would you like to select a graduation ceremony to come? Oh, I don't want to be bothered with that bloody stuff. <laughs> oh, yeah, why not? I spent 13 bloody years of my life. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, I'll do it. And you go there, and you've got instructions. You've got to doff your bonnet to the dean. Uh, and uh, they read your blurb, and then you put your bonnet on, you come up and you shake hands, and then you have to doff your bonnet at some point. And you, so you go there and they give you these instructions and you put this outlandish gear on, you feel stupid, <laughs> and this floppy hat. And then I caught sight of myself in a window. I thought, oh, that looks pretty good. <laughs> I wouldn't mind wearing that for my clients. That would impress them. <laughs> in fact, I might come to dinner in it. <laughs> you know, it's, it's silly, isn't it? But, you know, that's pretty good. Uh, and, but you do feel stupid at the same time. And you can see everyone else surreptitiously looking in the window. And then you go into this hall and you keep looking at these intros. Would I like get it right? When do I doff my bonnet? And you've got this hall full of people. There's only three that are interested in me. <laughs> But it feels like some, I'm doing this performance in front of them. And you go there, it's all over. And you have a lukewarm cup of tea in the <laughs> hall afterwards and go home. So what's that all about? <laughs> but a couple of days later, I was reflecting and I thought, actually a part of me now knows that I've got my PhD that didn't know before, but I didn't know it didn't know because I wasn't in touch with it, you know? This really taught me something really important about the nature of ritual, which our culture is impoverished in. We've given it away. When we left the churches, we, we lost rituals. Uh, and so I think, you know, these, the inauguration of the New Hall is an opportunity for a ritual, and if you can infuse some symbols into it, because symbols go straight down into this deep layer. Wonderful. <laughs> Excellent. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Wonderful. Yeah, why not bring humour into it too? So, uh, you know, I think to, to, to really build this culture means we're working on this dimension of identity. Now, when you've got that sorted, how long will that take? Let's say a couple of years. Uh, we're getting a long way down the track. Are you still preoccupied with that, with that fire, people will be saying? Uh, but yes, you are. It's absolutely leg legitimate. But then eventually you do sort of, uh, I know where I'm going, I know what I'm doing, I, I understand, I could tell you the story of this fire and so on. Then unexpectedly, what people describe to me, they suddenly go through a period, suddenly, they, they, when, when they no longer have a lot of demands, they s go through a period where they feel a kind of utter exhaustion that they don't quite know how to describe. It's more of an emotional, moral, social exhaustion. 
I can't bear to talk to people. I don't want to go anywhere. I don't want to see anyone. I don't want to interact with anyone. I just want to be by myself. I just want people to leave me alone. And of course, all the well-meaning friends will say, what's happened to Rob? I haven't seen him around. We better go and check on him. Uh, there, there was there's a wonderful narrative by uh, a, a really wonderful community leader from Mount Macedon who was the wife of the CFA captain. And uh, quite some years later, many years later, she wrote her narrative of it. And uh, she talks about this period. She said everyone hit this point at some stage of the recovery where they just had to absolutely go into themselves. I remember her telling me that she got to a point where she got her family off to school and work and then she would lock the door and go into the cupboard, the wardrobe, and close the door because she was so well connected in the community she knew that people would be around pretty soon to start talking to her and she couldn't bear it. And if she didn't answer the door, they knew her car was in there. So they'd go around and they'd be peering in the window. Are you there, Mary? Knock, knock, knock. Are you there, Mary? Knock, knock. And they'd go round and round and round. And she'd be in the wardrobe with the door shut until they eventually went away and then she'd come out. Now, it's, a, it's like an image, isn't it? I think, now, I call that recovery from recovery. Because recovery is hard work all the way through. Even the identity process is hard work, but in a different place. And so I think it's very important to be ready for that and to respect it because I think that's when you start to reactivate the feedback systems um, and, uh, uh, and, and start to mull and reconstitute yourself as the new person. Think about the, uh, the chrysalis. The, uh, the worm goes through a period of just being goo and then the butterfly forms and so on, that gooiness, the, l the formlessness. I think we need to uh, recognise that. And if we don't take that time out, so often, and we get it the same with uh, uh, traumas and bereavements, often the time people really need a good slab of time off is about two or three years down the track. When everybody's thinking, but you've had your time off, you should be over it by now. No, this is really when I absolutely need it because that's your best prevention of health problems I suspect reinstituting the healthy feedback mechanisms that ensure that you take care of yourself and meet your needs because you're aware of your needs um, because you've if you're a functional people you've trained yourself to ignore your needs for a long time and so you've got to come out of that and reconnect so um, there's a bit of work to do yet. Um, yeah. I just want to say, when I was 16, our house was burnt down. We were away in Queensland at the time. And we were doing, I, my sister and I did correspondence, my mother took it. And it was probably a couple of months into it when nobody was talking. Dad was a very silent dad. Mum was breathing, but she wasn't talking about it. My teacher, who knew I loved writing conversation, asked me to write it down. And that was wonderful for me. Mm. So there's been research in the United States about journaling. Yeah. Uh, that, uh, and they've done all the measurements. This is incredibly beneficial. Any form of story, language, uh, narrative in any medium at all. Uh, even painting is a medium. Uh, so, yeah, thank you for that. That's uh, really important. No, it's very cathartic, and uh, even with my practice as a counsellor, you know, getting children to draw pictures of their grief and things, yeah. and for some that could write, yep. it, it was really helpful. Yes, so. yes, you had that from experience, yeah. So, uh, yeah, continue to support each other. Oh, yeah, Fiona. Yes. So when you get to that point where you go, right, I just need to, like, you know, get in the wardrobe and not giving yourself a hard time about being yep. um, in that place is really important. Yeah. Because I think that's the, that's the struggle in itself. 
Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yep, yeah. yeah. To to go with these needs, because mm. if you override them, you're blunting your own feedback systems, which you, you will uh, tell on your health eventually. Mm. Yeah. 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 Well, of course. It cuts right across the major resource, doesn't it, the social world? And COVID had very varied effects. Some people didn't mind being in isolation, it was nice and peaceful. Others uh, nearly went crazy, especially if they didn't like the people they were living with and uh, everything in between. But I, I think um, it's kind of hard for people to preserve the narrative of that time, don't you think? That it's just like a blur, because I think we lost the routines that we use as markers uh, for the passage of time. Yeah? As a result of that, yeah. Yeah, I'm not back in there, anything. Yeah. Oh, so it's been a creative, yeah which is really a, a good way to think about a crisis, is how can we use this creatively to do what's more important? Yeah. And uh, we've got this big social problem of uh, the workers don't want to go back to the office, do they? And the bosses are saying, no, you've got to come back. And they're going to the courts and saying, well, you can't tell us what to do. <laughs> they would never have thought of doing that beforehand. I'm not going to come to work for a few weeks. No, they... <laughs> Uh, so there's a social process, but I mean that touches on the whole thing of uh, you know repeated and compounding disasters and and so on. But I think I reckon what I observe is a lot of the uh, recovery processes that you would expect to see uh, got suspended during the lockdowns. They just didn't go in because everyone had to shift into. Um, uh, adjusting to lockdown and and trying to manage that, so you know I think in many ways it's lost time for for the recovery of this. But what, what do you all think? How do you think? I, I loved it because we were licking our wounds from the fire and yep. all, all those processes, and I didn't have to engage with anybody and and. The, I didn't have to touch anybody who wanted to rush up and say, oh, you poor thing, or any of that. Mm. I, if we lived in a town, that would have been different. But because we lived out of town, we had our 16 kilometre run into the supermarket, which we could enjoy. Mm. And I just loved it. Mm. <laughs> Uh, I still don't like anybody coming to you. But you see, you, you make me think you're probably an introvert. And I think introverts probably like lockdown. Extroverts uh, went crazy because they weren't getting the stimulation. Uh, so, yeah, I think that's, that's having an awareness of that variety. Yeah. What do others think? Mm. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, early on, um, coming to the, the, the three week get together or something, um, Danville was fantastic. Um, just at the point of time when you're getting that initial shock off, mm. and you're actually engaging with people. Mm. Um, even <laughs> the rumours going out of people have been killed in all that sort of stuff, which they hadn't seen. Mm. Mm. It's just connecting with people who you just didn't know how they were. Yeah. 
Yeah. It's in. Yeah. So it derails uh, uh, rec natural recovery processes. Yeah. Mm. Even contacted the forestry to see where we could go, and um, when they when they, those boys went back to school, they were ahead of everybody else. Really? Yeah. And she was saying, "Oh well, I wish I'd gone on to university. I'm teaching these boys." <laughs> but you no, know, they did really well, mm. and they were very healthy by the time it was over. Mm. So. Yeah. So it's creative use. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. yeah. So that's the challenge for us to keep creative, mm. um, and not get too bogged down in stress mentality. Look, uh, uh, maybe should we turn the cameras off and uh, thanks very much and uh, it's wonderful to be here and hear your stories.